Can you can you see me? <laughs> we have a picture of you <laughs> and your smiling face. So I am. Uh, I'm in a vehicle pulled on the side of the road. I apologize. I'm, my father is ill, so I've got to go see him. Oh well, I certainly understand. But no, we can see you now. Um, uh, Good. Um, so um, I'm sorry to hear about your father, and I know. Uh, you must have so many things going on professionally and, and personally. And I greatly appreciate your taking this time. Nice to be with you, actually. So, um, can Maurice, can, for just those who aren't familiar with LIS, could you give us like a one minute background on? I know you, I, I mentioned you were started by the Ford Foundation, a little bit about what you do and the states you're in. And then we want to do a deep dive onto uh, role and responsibility of. of of uh, anchor institutions in community engagement. Sure, sure. Well, um, good afternoon, I guess, to everybody. Um, I uh, LISC is a 40-year-old community development, community development finance institution. Um, we were started, we were an idea in the Ford Foundation that was um, basically spawned and turned into, at the end of the day, a uh, a separate or, or a, um, a, a nonprofit of our own. And so we started back in 1979, 1980. And uh, we now work in uh, 35 different metropolitan offices around the country. Uh, plus, we work in about now uh, 2,200 rural counties in 44 states. And what we do what people know us for is um, community development, particularly community development finance. And by that, I mean uh, we provide capital, loans, grants, technical assistance to projects that are in the affordable housing arena or community facilities like theaters or uh, recreation centers or art centers, uh, small business financing, particularly small businesses that are owned and are operated by women and or people of color and that are serving low and moderate income communities, uh, workforce development uh, that's serving uh, the hardest hit places in urban and rural areas with a real focus on helping uh, low and moderate income people and communities of color get onto a viable pathway to a living wage job, um, changing uh, policies to try to make the system work better for poor folks uh, and for people living in uh, uh, disinvested or underinvested uh, areas. The entire gamut of what we would call community and inclusive economic development work, we do it. In 40 years time, We've invested about uh, $22 billion in these places and people that I just described. And we've leveraged, in addition to us, about $65 billion. Uh, and it's all with a primary mission of helping those places in the country that are underinvested or disinvested uh, to get back on a pathway of uh, development and progress and to garner more resources uh, to make these places excellent places to live and raise a family and operate a business, et cetera. That's probably a long-winded uh, uh, no, response, no. Uh, but that's, uh, that's what we're about. So if I'm a university hospital center in, I don't know, uh, Detroit, how do, how do I work? Do I approach the LISC office, the local LISC office, or how does, it, how does that work? Yeah, it can, you can, there's no wrong door to come into LISC. So we do have a Detroit office, uh, and more likely than not, uh, the, if you're a hospital in Detroit, you're going to know about LISC through the local office there. But usually the work that we do is a joint venture between that local office and the national office, which is part of one nonprofit, by the way, and partnering with uh, that local hospital. And we work with hospitals, by the way, all over the country now. And hospitals are coming to us 
uh, primarily because they want to tackle social determinants of health. You all will know this better than anybody, but 80% of the determinants of people's health and life expectancy is what happens outside of the clinical setting. It's, you know, do you have access to healthy food? Do you have access to healthy and affordable housing? Are you under stress because you're underemployed and low wages, et cetera? And we are the ones that these hospitals have been working with to invest in funds that um, develop or preserve affordable housing, to invest in funds that provide access to credit to these small businesses so you can uh, tackle the racial wealth gap, to invest in funds that uh, lead to, frankly, preparing people for jobs in the healthcare sector, for example. Um, so a long-winded way of saying that that hospital could come to us through the Detroit office, they could come to us through our national office. For us, it doesn't matter which door you come into, we put a multi-sector team around you uh, and try to develop a, a, a vehicle through which to get work done that fits the problems you want to try to solve. So I know one of the things when, uh, after I met you, I read some of your uh, papers and I, uh, a couple, two years ago, I think you did talk uh, about the role of anchor institutions and you pointed out that in many uh, settings, uh, universities are often the largest employer uh, or the hospital is oh, often the largest employer and you put out some proposals for universities to buy locally, hire locally, and invest locally. Can you talk a little bit yep. about, about that? Absolutely. So that's right. Look, it's eds and meds, right? Uh, yeah. In most of the places where we work, um, eds and meds are sometimes the only anchor institutions, but always part of the anchor institution um, uh, cohort in that place. And we have worked with uh, higher ed and um, um, uh, hospital systems uh, in a number of different ways. Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, uh, a few years back, we partnered with Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, Northeastern was expanding, uh, wow, it seems like ages ago now, given where we are. Northeastern was uh, expanding classrooms, uh, uh, building uh, new dorms, and they were, um, you know, expanding into their neighborhoods. Well, they wanted, their neighborhoods were some of the poor, the, around them were some of the poorest in Boston, and they wanted to uh, invest in those neighborhoods. And so, they came to us and we forged a partnership with them whereby they were using a chunk of their um, uh, procurement authority to invest in businesses that were either already in that neighborhood or that were willing to locate and provide jobs in that neighborhood. That neighborhood, uh, by the way, being uh, overwhelmingly uh, African-American or Latino uh, uh, population. Um, what we agreed to do with them, they came to us, they basically used a, uh, a few million dollars as a loan loss reserve. We then, with that loan loss reserve, made um, loans to small businesses uh, that could then compete successfully for procurement contracts from the university. Uh, and it was a way in which they wanted to uh, cultivate the development of more minority and women-owned businesses as their vendors. That's, that'll give you an example. Let me go to Toledo, Ohio. In Toledo, Ohio, uh, ProMedica Hospital is one of the key anchor institutions in the city. And they came to us, uh, initially they came to us and said, hey, look, we are seeing a higher incidence of asthma coming from a particular neighborhood through our emergency department. We treat these children, we send them back home, but we're still getting a higher incidence from this particular neighborhood than we're getting from others. We know that the problem stems in the home, can you help us? We worked with ProMedica and KeyBank, and we put together a, um, a small grant pool that we use to provide grant dollars to 
uh, ho homeowners in a particular neighborhood uh, so that those homeowners could get mold out of their uh, housing, uh, get lead paint out, the kinds of things you would do to get the kinds of things that contribute to asthma out. And then they measured the incidence of folks presenting in their, of children presenting in their um, emergency room with, um, with asthmatic attacks. Uh, and and it, uh, surprise, surprise, it went down. Uh, we also are, we helped with ProMedica. They wanted to attack a, um, a food desert. We helped them to construct uh, and operate a grocery store in a place where there was no grocery store, a workforce development center that is preparing people for jobs in the healthcare sector. So they're hiring some of these folks. So the anchor institutions in my mind are key, key players and key partners of ours and their power to really get involved and transform neighborhoods we're seeing all around the country. So can you, Maurice, can you give a little bit of background how you got involved with this? I think you were involved with economic development in Virginia and how did you get involved with LIST? I was the, uh, yeah. I was um, the Secretary of Commerce and Trade for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, and I went from that job to LISC and look at, in the, uh, I knew about LISC and, and community development finance from a job I had in the treasury department in the late nineties. Um, but what I, what, what I realized when I was working in the Commonwealth, which was a great job was I was spending, um, 80% of my time on 20% of the state, uh, because that was the, that was the 20% of the state that was most prepared to get the Amazons of the world. Um, and what I really wanted to do and the reason why LISC was so attractive is I wanted to spend 100% of my time on that 80% of the state that needed more investment, that needed more preparation in order to be seen by outsiders as more investment worthy. So this job at LISC has given me the chance to spend 100% of my time on the most under-invested in and disinvested and under-resourced places uh, around the country and to try to aggregate resources and partners to invest in them. There's talent in every community across America, urban and rural. What there is not is opportunity but we can catalyze opportunity with the help of anchor institutions, without a doubt. So what about the um, federal government came out with a lot of money for paycheck protection and lots of other things and the house, as you probably know, has a much more ambitious program. What do you think we need for our communities right now in terms of uh, a federal response? Uh, you know, low income housing is a long play. What, what do we need right now? So what we need right now is a Marshall Plan for the toughest zip codes in our uh, country. And let me tell you what I mean by that. When I was the um, Secretary of uh, Commerce and Trade for Virginia, I worked in the State Capitol Building. Um, I could drive from the State Capitol Building, well, I worked in the State Capitol Complex, I should say. I could drive from that complex five miles to the east, this is Richmond, Virginia, five miles to the east, and I would be in a zip code where the um, life expectancy was 63 years of age, where the overwhelming population was black and brown folks, Latino, uh, African American. I could go back to that, um, uh, state capital complex that I could drive five miles to the west and I would be in a zip code where the life expectancy was 83 years of age. 10 minutes apart, 20 years difference in life expectancy. The difference could not be accounted for by what was happening in the clinical settings and hospitals and doctor's offices and dentist offices that people were visiting. That wasn't what it was about. It was the difference in the conditions under which people lived. It was 
you know, who had quality housing that they could afford, who had jobs that paid livable wages, who had a, a recreation center in their community, who had good schools and education. What we need is a Marshall Plan for the east of the capital complex zip codes across the country. And here's the deal, that same um, two worlds that I just described in Richmond are present in every city in America, certainly everyone that we work in. And it can be fixed, but you have got to put together a multi-disciplinary uh, strategy to get at those things that's causing that difference in life expectancy. And it can be done. We're doing it with anchor institutions. We need the federal government to invest big in these zip codes in the same way that we recognize that we needed a strong Europe after World War II. We cannot afford these two different worlds or two different Americas that we have right now. And the federal government can be a key player in us being able to execute a Marshall Plan in these places. The federal government can't do it by itself, but boy, do we need it to be a really, really key leader and player in, in, uh, in causing something like this to happen and seed capital and policies and leadership absolutely doable. Yeah, you, I mean, I, you would make a comment about the current political situation, given um, the murders and uh, the, you know, the discussion about racial climate. I, I would think that if we could ever get a Marshall Plan, uh, this is the time, whether it's about the pandemic or whether it's about addressing racial injustice. I, the, the, uh, there, the underlying causes of our having literally two Americas is what's going, the different worlds that people are living in, whether it's urban versus rural or east of Richmond versus west of Richmond, east DC, Anacostia, west DC, uh, South Boston, North Boston, I mean, it's every city, it's every place. And yes, we can do something about it. It's not like we don't have the solutions. What we don't have is the will to do it at the scale that we did it in Europe after World War II. However, we have just as much at stake. And what you're seeing now across the country with the racial tension and the protests, these things are really the, um, the symptoms or the result of years of two worlds, of two Americas. We can do something about it, but we do need national leadership to be a part of the solution, not the solution by itself, because this should be public sector and private sector, federal, state, and local. But the a missing big piece right now is, is the national stuff, no question about it, is the federal piece. And I think yesterday you were on with some NBA players and the former mayor of New Orleans for a discussion oh, yeah. last night. Yes, yes, yes. It, I think it, I think it broadcast uh, last night. And um, um, actually, I haven't seen the broadcast yet, but I was a part of the conversation. So I hope it, uh, I hope it came out all right. But you know, we were talking about these kinds of issues. Uh, we were, we were talking about. Um, the role that uh, that race has played in um, in the development of America, and then and the role that lack of health equity has played in these disparities that you see uh, in the country, and we were talking about the fact that look, we're at a catharsis moment in the country. Uh, we this is a critical critical time, and. Uh, I believe it gives us a chance to choose again to actually strive for a more perfect union. But you have to have the will of the public sector and the private sector, the federal, state, and the local, and good people who want to change this. But 
the solutions are there. Uh, it's not like we don't know how to do this stuff. It's do we have the will to do to go big, yeah. basically. Well, I, I don't know. I guess time will tell. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very impressed with what, what you've done personally, uh, the role of LISC. I know we're getting close to four o'clock, which is our end time. And I greatly appreciate, um, especially given uh, the health uh, issues with your father, that you, you took time to stop by and, and, and talk with us. If somebody wants to get a hold of LISC, they can send me a, they can send me an email at mjones at lisk.org our website is our website is www uh, it's lisk.org so they can also go up on lisk.org website but you can send me an email directly mjones at lisk.org i'd be happy will, to engage with you okay we will we will post that for the participants uh, thank you very much and uh, with that, Maurice, again, I'm very impressed that you were able to come on given uh, the situation. And thank you and good luck and your, Thanks. your inspiration. Hopefully we will get and we will build uh, a, you know, a new Marshall Plan, Marshall Plan 2.0. I look forward to it. And okay. thanks for your time. Thanks okay. to all of you all. Uh, everybody stay healthy, stay well, keep the faith. All right. we, can, we can be stronger. So thanks a lot, stay well. All right, thanks, Maurice. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.